Hey everyone, this is Derek Bros with the Conscious Resistance Network. I'm here in Houston, Texas, my hometown, and I'm talking with a new friend of mine, hoping to learn more about what he's up to. This is Mr. Jim Murray. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, and it's good to meet you. It's good to be here. Yeah, you well, you came to Houston for this weekend. This is really just kind of a spur of moment interview. Um, I wanted to give you an opportunity to tell a little bit about your background. For those who are watching, you're going to see the links below the video. You'll find the article and some of the stuff we're going to talk about, Jim's work, Nikola Tesla's work, and what the current you know efforts are to bring that work back to the, to the modern world. So before we get into that, tell everybody a little bit about who you are and how you got into this line of work. Well, it's actually a pretty long story, but I'll try to cut it to the, to the chase here. Um, basically, I started off studying nuclear physics. Uh, that was my real love at, at a younger age. And uh, particle accelerators in particular were something that I really wanted to get involved with. But as I matured and studied more physics, I realized that um, it just didn't feel like that was going to go anywhere. And somewhere along the line, I had crossed paths with uh, Nikola Tesla's work, <clears throat> pardon me, because it's almost inevitable if you're studying electromagnetics, his name is going to come up. <clears throat> so I made it my business to uh, inform myself about him and the things he had accomplished. And uh, in, in, that, uh, in that pursuit, I found out that um, there were things that the scientific community actually didn't accept, uh, which Tesla had... Um, claimed to have made great strides uh, in. And those were the things that wound up interesting, uh, being most interesting to me. So um, I started to delve into that the best I could, and the information was very sketchy. But I was fortunate in uh, being given a gift at one point by a gentleman that I was working with in Connecticut years ago. And it was uh, an original huge collection of Tesla's work called Lectures, Patents, and Articles, which was actually published by um, the, Yugos the Yugoslavian people uh, in commemoration of Tesla's work. And once I had that and I read it just like a Bible, I got so familiar with it that I began to read between the lines. And that gave me some insights, which I didn't have previously, and um, basically led me to realized that the best way to understand what Tesla was doing was to try and duplicate the things that he had claimed to have accomplished. Now, everybody knows about the motors and the radio and some of the other work that he did. He was actually the true inventor of radio, was not Marconi. Marconi, with J.P. Morgan's help, actually stole the mm -hmm. concept from, from Tesla. But anyway, make a long story short, I did uh, start to do experimental work. And, of course, it was very difficult in the beginning with no guidelines. But sooner or later, I started to see things that were a little bit nebulous at first and then became a little bit clearer. And I finally began to realize what the man was driving at. And progress was very slow. I started this work when I was 19, and I'm 68. So... It's taken that long to lay the foundations and understand what was actually going on. And uh, contrary to what most people think, uh, there's actually two or three segments of Tesla's work. And I would say that most people are conscious only of the first, uh, the first leg of his, of his actual research. The other stuff gets more and more obtuse and more and more um, mystical in a certain sense. And so the scientific community doesn't go there. But that's actually where you have to go if you want to understand Tesla's concept of energy and, and how to do unusual things with it. Let's, so let's talk a little bit more about that. Can you give us, um, just for those who may not be familiar, who exactly Tesla was? And Nick, you mentioned you know, him being the original true inventor of the radio, and some people also credit him for a lot of other modern technology. Can you give us uh, some ideas on what he was involved with and you know, how important he really is. Well, the most important thing that Tesla did, in my opinion, which almost everybody knows about, um, was invention of the rotating magnetic field. That's the concept that gave rise to uh, three-phase motors. And, of course, the world wouldn't be what it is today without three-phase motors. 
Um, also, eventually, that was reduced down to single phase motors, uh, which, of course, appear in just about every appliance, you know, universally these days. So just those two things alone have changed the world. But in order to get power from one place to another, you also have to have three phase generators, transmission lines, transformers, and a whole host of other technological advances that did not exist, uh, or at least they were not in use, you know, as a as a widespread phenomenon when Tesla introduced, you know, three-phase technology. Prior to that, everybody was leaning on DC, which was Edison's baby. And the problem with DC is, you know, you just can't transmit it very far. You'd have to have a power plant on every corner, from, you know, to, to implement that, that concept. So those were the early days. And then he went on to investigate um, better methods of transmitting power. So originally it was just from the generator through a high voltage transformer and across a bunch of transmission lines down to another transformer and then local distribution. And that's pretty much what we do today. But the, um, the idea of using high voltage uh, to um, facilitate transmission efficiency was the original approach that Tesla used, but that necessitates wires. And um, then he started to explore the idea of, well, what if we don't use wires? What if we had a way of transmitting power uh, either through the ground or through the air? And that led him to a whole nother series of investigations. And don't forget, when you start to uh, depart from any recognized paradigm, uh, you always are going to find various other unexpected technologies as spin-offs. And so when Tesla started opening all these doors, it just led to so many different things that the guy was like a virtual juggling act in terms of, of all of the things that he found. Um, x-rays. He played around with x-rays. He had the ability to x-ray the human skull at a distance of 50 feet away from the subject when Rankin was still playing around with partially fogged photographic plates. So, I mean, this guy was a, a virtual genius, and he was, he was making immense strides in everything that he put his hands on. So, eventually, um, he got involved with so many things that you would, it would really take an hour just to describe everything he did. Robotics was another thing the guy had, radio control at a distance, um, vertical takeoff and landing for airplanes, um, Believe it or not, anti-gravity was something he was involved with. Whether he succeeded in that, we don't know. Because when he died, um, his records were immediately impounded by governmental agencies. So we really don't know exactly what hidden things he was working on. But there's enough that has survived in the uh, available literature that if you really inspect it in detail... He talks about so many things. And the guy could read uh, and speak at least seven languages. And he was very um, familiar with some of the less known, uh, I, I would like to say scientific, but uh, certainly um, aspects of literature from, from obscure places like uh, the Vedas, for instance, from India and things of that sort. So we know that he dabbled in mystical um, phenomena, not necessarily as a participant, but at least he knew about these things. And, um, you know, in, in that area of the world, there's a lot of stuff written, like the Mahabharata, for instance, disguise, discusses uh, uh, early warfare, where they actually were making use of missiles and uh, flying machines and bombs that sound very much like nuclear weapons. And so it's very difficult to say what all he knew about. But um, if you just look at what he accomplished, it's formidable. There's, there's just no other single human being has ever accomplished as many things as, as Tesla. I think he had eight or 900 patents that we know about. So as you mentioned, you know, much of the modern world has sort of forgotten Tesla because 
we get people credited with some of his work. Like Edison gets more, you know, credit for inventing. Marconi. And yeah, like you said, Marconi with the radio. So his his work is sort of lost, although there, he does have a, I would say, like a cult-like following of those who are trying to keep his work alive. How is it perceived, you know, in your experience with um, other researchers, other scientists in the mainstream today in 2015? Is it, you know, laughed at or do they even look at it? Well, it's really funny because uh, there are a few people that I have crossed paths with that are quietly enamored of Tesla, you know, to a very grand extent. But a lot of the scientists that you talk to, they have this bizarre perception of the man, which is, yes, he was a total genius from point A to point B. And that area encompasses all of the stuff that uh, traditional science is willing to, uh, to give him credit for. After that, he's considered to have been senile because the things that he was claiming, the current scientific paradigm just say, well, they're impossible, so he's, he's nuts, you know. So there's this really strange segmented impression of the guy that in the beginning of his career, he was a genius, and then he just became an idiot. And so anything that was labeled with the idiocy part is discarded, except by the cult followers. And the problem with those people is that most of them don't have any scientific background. They're just caught up in the mystique of the man. Mm -hmm. And so while it's great that it perpetuates his legacy in a certain respect, it doesn't lend anything to the to the in-depth investigation that's necessary to really penetrate the areas that have been suppressed or forgotten or whatever word you want to mm -hmm. want to use there. So in that respect, I feel a little bit unique because I started off as a physics and math student. I had very classical objectives. And the more I get into Tesla stuff, the more I realize, hey, there's, there's definitely something else here. And I made myself a vow that I was going to find it at all costs. And if I did, I'd do something constructive with it. And if I didn't, oh well. Hmm. You can't uh, you can't be criticized for trying. At That's least true. I didn't think you could. <laughs> Before we move on to what you're doing now and how people can find out more and help, um, if you don't mind just speculating briefly, why do you think it is that his work is looked in that manner that you just described? You know, he's seen uh, why is the scientific paradigm so afraid to go outside of these, you know, boundaries? I don't, think, I don't think the real people that are in the know are afraid. I think that you have a very segmented um, series of scientific groups or circles of activity in the, in the technical uh, arena. And th this is done deliberately. I mean, even the Masons are structured this way, where you have the people at the very top who know everything that's going on, and then as you come down the ladder... It just turns into a men's social club mm -hmm. type of thing. And then there's all the plateaus in between. And it's the same thing with the scientific community. Um, they want certain people who are working on certain things to be totally um, informed. And then the rest of them, they kind of keep an arm's length from, from certain tidbits of knowledge because those people are assigned to maintaining what's allowed to be given to the masses. And so you do need a segmented um, regime from that, from that perspective. Um, but to answer your question in more direct, uh, more direct detail, um, the, the cutoff point happens to be, at least in my opinion, um, certain areas of physics which are considered sacred. Um, the, the most prominent being conservation of energy. Um, which is really ridiculous because um, one of Tesla's pet descriptions of energy was that it is actually uh, non-existent. Um, and, and he comes to this statement by the following analogy. If you're carrying a bomb around, it just looks like a cylinder and it doesn't do anything until it explodes. But when it explodes... The thing that does the damage is not energy. It's the rate of change of energy, which is actually power. So by turning energy into a buzzword, it, it defocuses the attention on the concept of power. And there's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, in the, um, 
in the money world, uh, energy is very convenient, uh, a very convenient parameter to embrace because it automatically allows you to relate uh, expenditure for fuel, financial expenditure for fuel uh, against a final delivered product. And power, if you understand it, is a continuum. And so if you're talking about something like uh, 10,000 watts, for instance, it, it's, a, it's a continuous thing, 10,000 watts. If you want to get more specific, you have to say 10,000 watts when. And as soon as you do that, it automatically changes it from power to energy. So a more concise example would be, let's assume we were photographing with a movie camera, somebody dropping a cannonball off a, a tall building. And we film the thing coming down, okay? Then we develop the film and we put it on a, on a professional projector and f throw it up on the screen. Well, when we watch that cannonball from the time that it was released until the time that it buries itself in the ground, that entire event describes the power that was accumulated by, by that whole mechanism, of the, weight, the mass of the ball and the gravity and all of that. But if we stop the film and examine any discrete frame and just leave it on the, on the projection screen uh, as if it was a slide, that is a snapshot of the event at a given point in time, and it automatically defines energy. So that's the real rudimentary difference between the two things. And so getting back to your question, people who embrace without any latitude whatsoever the so-called conservation of energy as a limiting factor in all of human endeavors, technological endeavors, um, use that as a cutoff point. If anybody comes up with something that has an inexplicable degree of efficiency, ah, it's got to be a violation of conservation of energy because everybody knows you can't get more out of a system than you put into it. The contradiction actually resides in a more subtle area than that. And that is that there are certain mathematical precepts which tell you that under certain very rare situations, there are circumstances in which the work that is done is not necessarily equal to the energy that's accrued. And those are the areas that you need to investigate. Nobody's talking about violating conservation of energy. What we're actually looking for is a situation or situations, plural, that can be described by a gain in the work done for a particular form of energy. And that's where I've been concentrating my, my efforts for the last 30 years or so, once I understood the ground rules. And so very few people um, go to that area of investigation simply because of the fact that, first of all, the mathematics is horrendous. Uh, a lot of it is beyond me. I have friends who are mathematicians that help me with that. Um, and the other reason is because, for the most part, except in some really, really horrendous areas of physics, most systems are deliberately approximated by linearization. And you're never going to see these effects in a linear system. They're all particular to systems which are totally nonlinear and require really advanced mathematics to understand. So a lot of the people that are out there dabbling, I give them all the credit in the world, but they better be prepared for some really excruciating learning curves and endless dedication if they expect to get anywhere because um, it's taken me almost 50 years to even begin to understand the ground rules. Absolutely. I mean, it sounds like what you're describing is what I think the, you know, those of us who are activists or researchers independently have come across in our own researches, not only in the paradigm of science, but in media and government. There's these different institutions that seek to preserve a certain type of mindset, whether that is, you know, with only this one type of science, like you said, in the conservation of energy, they're, they're sort of afraid to go beyond those boundaries. And I think it's because 
there are implications. If Tesla's work is shown to be more efficient and um, some people believe could revolutionize the world, then there are people who stand to lose a lot of money in that process and possibly a lot of power in that process. Um, and you, as you said, you've been working on this for close to, to 50 years now. So what is it that people can do to help you and what are you doing now to bring the knowledge that you've gained to the world and to you know the people of 2015? Well, it's very difficult to... Um to answer that question, you know, in a, in a simplistic way. Uh, ultimately, what needs to be done is somebody has to put up enough money, and we're talking millions, not, you know, nickels and dimes, to really break through the, the restraints of the existing paradigm when it comes to understanding energy and nonlinear physics and things of that nature. I mean, the government doesn't have any problem doing it for themselves. But they, as you said, the vested interests don't want the general public to get a hold of this because the resulting paradigm shift would be pretty excruciating, at least to the people who are, you know, doing well with the, the current arrangement. But um, ultimately, it has to happen. And, and it's going to happen if, if I don't do it, somebody else will do it. Because, first of all, it's there. It's part of reality. And it's just a question of learning how to penetrate into that. Secondly, I honestly believe that there are certain factions of maybe not our government, but some government somewhere that's already doing this on their own and just keeping the lid on it because they already know that once we exhaust our current fuels and whatnot, there better be something to take its place. Mm -hmm. And so that's quietly being pursued, I'm sure. But as far as what can the general public do to help, I think just being aware of the fact that there are other options is really a big thing because people who are dedicated in a serious way uh, to doing this, you'd be, you'd be surprised the flack they get, which is very demeaning. And it's very, I mean, you have to have a strong personality to just, sh you know, shrug it off. Luckily, I'm in, that, I'm in that league, but there's a lot of other people that just give up. Um, and so the other thing that can be done, which um, I was interested in doing, um, is to... Uh, is to write a book, which wouldn't be a technical book in the n normal sense of the term, because first of all, the work isn't finished. And second of all, if it was to really be uh, a, a technical expose, for instance, you're talking about a series of writings that nobody would want to read, except maybe for some really advanced you know, people. And so there wouldn't be anything in it. But I think that there's a lot of value in relating the whole story, um, the ups and downs that are experienced and the, the revelations and the rewards that come with persistence and hard work when it comes to accomplishing anything in life. Those are the kind of things that the average person can appreciate. And telling that story, at least in my case, is a very long-winded undertaking. As a matter of fact, I envision two volumes and um, a minimum of 60 chapters. So that, that's a pretty big, you know, a pretty big uh, document to prepare. And not only that, but it's, um, it's going to be backed up by photographs and other data when, when it's appropriate and things of that nature. So it's not, it's not like writing a pamphlet, you know, and you actually have recently launched a crowdfunding campaign to do this as well, but it's since been taken down. Do you want to talk any about that, why it got taken down, and uh, if, it, if you're planning to bring it back? Well, it isn't really up to me, but um, the, the reason it got taken down was really, in my opinion, just so moronic that it's almost unbelievable. Um, whoever was um, supporting that um, was contacted by some yahoo in the, in the audience out there that said that, oh, we just read an article that this guy named Jim Murray, who is an electrical engineer in Tulsa, died. And so this has to be a fraud. If the guy is already dead, why is he going to write a book? Or how is he going to write a book? And so instead of contacting me and saying, hey, you know, are you really dead? You know, be nice to interview a corpse, you know. No, that didn't happen. They just unceremoniously took it down. Uh, there, there was some money in there, not a whole lot, but there was some money in there, and uh, I don't know what became of that. And I feel badly for the people who, out of the goodness of their hearts, you know, reached into their pocket to, um, to make a donation. I don't know how they're going to be reimbursed. 
Um, from what I understand, the Free Thought Project has contacted the uh, the host of that fundraiser on several occasions and have not gotten anywhere with uh, resolving the issue. So I just kind of wrote it off. I mean, you know, I'll get the book done one way or another. It's just that a few bucks would have helped, you know. Yeah. And people don't seem to understand that writing a book uh, of that nature and that size and making it appealing is not an easy undertaking because once you've written so much material, you can edit it until you're blue in the face and you're going to miss stuff. Mm -hmm. You have to turn around when you've got the document as far along as you think you can push it yourself and hand it over to a professional editor and let them review it with fresh eyes, let them make you know, meaningful suggestions and that type of thing. And they don't work for free. Absolutely. And the publishers don't necessarily work for free. Even if you go to um, one of these um, publish-on-demand houses, you know, they charge you thousands of dollars just to set the, the printers up and, uh, and to do the, uh, the preliminary printing. So, you know, people get this ridiculous idea that you can sit down in front of a typewriter or a computer and just rattle the keys a little bit, and out comes this fantastic uh, final document, and it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, absolutely. I can say as somebody who's a recent author of a very small book, less than 100 pages, done independently, that that alone costs $1,200, and what you're describing is something much larger, much more in-depth, and you know that takes money, it takes time. And for those who are curious, he seems to be alive, from what I can tell. If <laughs> so. not, it's a damn good act. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you want to add to those who are listening, how they might um, contact you to help if, they were, if they're interested in supporting your future efforts or just spreading the word? I think that rather than contact me, which would be a lovely gesture but not realistic because I'm busy from sunup till sundown and beyond, it would be much more meaningful to contact the Free Thought Project since they were the ones that actually launched this entire endeavor. And um, what they have done in the past is that if there's – uh, a meaningful contact or somebody that really has something positive to contribute or whatever, then they extract that particular individual from the general responses and forward it on to me, and then I'll consider whether or not I want to speak to that person. Well, if you're curious about learning more about this, if you want to help out, contact freethoughtproject.com, and thank you for your time. No problem. Thank you. Thank you.